Okay, looks like everybody is seated, and I think we're uh, ready to go on this pretty long talk. Uh, hi, I am Alex Zurichenko. It's my talk, Scraping Your Way to a Data Set. Just a little bit about me. I'm a university student at a university in a place called Pittsburgh. I separately study two different things, and I want to do a third thing, but that's I should stop. Uh, I'm currently a data engineering intern at Highmark Health, where I just use Python all day. It's pretty fun. Uh, and for me, I've been using Python for the last four years to do either, actually for the past year, do professional work, but past three years for just anything that I just felt like doing. So what is this talk about? Because from the title, you might assume scraping. But there's also, I think, a lot more that needs to be done to get from scraping to a data set. Like, asking questions, understanding our data sources, organizing that data into a data set, which is a very important thing, or even how do I be a good scraper? Because that's a very interesting question. But essentially our goal, I want to take some weird and structured data from the internet, I want to get a table out of it. And I'm going to do this in a few phases. We're going to go through the first one of understanding the problem, then understanding the sources, scraping the sources, constructing the data set, and then really briefly using the data set, because that's, like, that's what all the other ML talks are for here. So understanding the problem. What, you might be wondering, what exactly do you need to understand about the problem? Well, let's just go through an example. So let's say you're a person like me, and you just have a curious question. When is the best time to buy blackout curtains? That's a very, very interesting question. And you might be wondering, why is that even a question? Well, let's just start with asking, what data is actually needed to answer this question? Should be, should be pretty obvious if we think very carefully. When is the best time to buy? As in, I need to know the price over time. And so some ex Chrome extension gives you a very convenient graph. And I can, from here, then understand when like prices will drop typically in patterns and all these kinds of things, which is very interesting, because this is over a month. Black occurrence fluctuate a lot. But notice when I said the pieces of data I needed were price and time, when there's a lot of other pieces of data, like the size of the currents, the color, the brand, the reviews. But are any of these really necessary? No. And the basic reason why is because that's not the question I'm asking. I already sort of asking the question because I know what I really want. I want black curtains. I know how long my windows are. I just, that's my question. So with that in mind, let's consider these two following problems that we're just going to go throughout the talk. One of them is a little straightforward. The other is a little open-ended. The one is trying to get data from the HTML, and the other is more about trying to access the back-end web APIs. So the first question, which I had for one day in freshman year, was how random are those draw machines? I think we all probably know what the answer is, but eh, I know some statistics. Why not figure that out? So for this problem, OK, I need probably two pieces of information, the winning numbers, and time, because I think there's some statistical things I probably need that time's important. So this one is the very basic, I just need to scrape some web pages just straight up. Second problem is more complex, and I'm not even going to show you the answer because I don't even know the answer to this one. Uh, this is called scheduling is a nightmare. And how can I make scheduling less of a nightmare for students? Um, and this one, when I ask this question, it's like, OK, what data do I need? A lot. <laughs> A lot of data. That's not even to begin for how much data you need to begin to understand all the different attributes. How can I solve these problems? So as we can see, like this is something you have to consider. And as your questions change, you have to consider different things you need. And this is going to be very important in understanding our sources. So when it comes to data, there's actually a lot of data you can get out there pretty publicly and availably. Like, uh, the government provides data. Here in Columbus provides data. Even Western PA provides data. And there's a lot of very useful sets. And you can solve or do a lot of public good problems. Like, there is a, actually, that's not even a good example. That's actually an example of scraping. But um, there's also developer APIs that exist, which are pretty handy. It's like, how do I want to, like, do I want to know if a song's very nice to groove to? 
Spotify probably has a weird attribute for that. They have a lot of weird attributes for songs. It makes sort of asking weirder questions about music very easy. And you can get these really, really nicely. But what we're really here for is, what if that doesn't exist? What if someone didn't spend the time to make a very nice data set publicly available, maintains it, updates it on a monthly, weekly, quarterly, however so schedule? That's where we come into scraping. And I'm going to be specific when I say scraping. I'm talking about web scraping, because there's a few different types of scraping. There's screen scraping. For example, like in any game, if you want to get statistics about like how like much you lose health or any of these things, it's sometimes hard to just try to pick up like network traffic or some nonsense when it's really easy when we have the object character recognition to just read it off your screen. Plain, plain, simple. There's also document scraping, which is also should seem a little familiar because this is basically scraping PDFs, uh, stuff like bank documents, bank statements. Like if you want to create a nice data set of like how much money do I waste over time, that's what it's really good for. But we're talking specifically about web scraping, which is a very interesting kind of scraping. It's it's a sort of scraping that has some issues. But before I go on, I just want to mention. Scraping is a last resort when it, in the form of web scraping. If you can avoid it or find somewhere else, go to that somewhere else. Use what's official. Because there's some potential problems with it. And this is where I put up the fun disclaimer of, I am not a lawyer, I'm just a college student. <laughs> it's been shown throughout like the times of just many, many weird cases, including this recent one with uh, Google, looking like they might have scraped data about lyrics from a lyrics website. So what has been found is sort of like two things to keep in mind. Um, usually scraping publicly available data is pretty good. Like if you don't have to log in or you don't have to do some really weird stuff and trying to exploit the serv underlying services, if you stay away from those things, you should be pretty good legally, hopefully. The other thing that's going to come in later is, okay, you have all this data, and you might be inclined to publish it in some form, like Google kind of did. Um, one thing is if, depending on what you're scraping, uh, they might just hide little things. This is like, for example, that no one can really copy a map because uh, services like Google Maps potentially put fake locations just to catch people copying them. Um, but also it has some weird other weird copyright issues because you technically don't really own the data and so it's probably best to do two things. Don't try to weirdly exploit websites and then two, probably don't post the data but using it for your personal or even sometimes business uses actually seems to be perfectly fine. If you want a very clear indicator of um, when to not, there's a thing called robots.txt. It's at the base of all websites. Like you can go to google.com slash robots.txt and this will come up. What this basically says is for any web crawler, so this would probably be a scraper in our case, uh, this says here's where you're not allowed to go and here's where you are allowed to go. Not all websites have this, but uh, the big ones do, like Facebook. Doesn't stop people from trying to scrape data, but it does mean eventually you'll get a cease and desist from them. So probably best to stay out of it. Remember, you can't violate robots.txt if you only scrape that one. Uh, there's actually really, there's one really nice scraping tool, which I'm not going to go in depth with called Scrapey, that also has a, just an option to, if the robots.txt says don't go here, it'll say don't, I'm not gonna go there. But anyways, let's get back to the program. So web scraping. It sort of means you actually need to learn about a few things like different web technologies, like, I mean, the fundamentals of JavaScript, HTML, CSS, HTTP requests like get and post, what does that mean? Um, things like templating, for example, most websites, it's usually just there's a template and then they just plop data in there. And that's a very, very important thing to note because that's what's gonna come up a lot. So let's, let's take a look. So. First example, so I have two samples. I'm specifically going for the Powerball. I have two examples of two different web pages. As you can see, there's different dates, different numbers. And there's a lot, and now it's time to like sort of inspect them and see what is consistent. I mean, we can see clearly, a lot of it's pretty consistent. Obviously, the header of it's consistent, the image is consistent, the sidebar is consistent. 
But even better, the data is consistent. It looks to be in the same format, which is really, really nice. We also notice the URL, it's kind of hard to see, but there's basically just an ID number at the end that changes by a few, which is kind of interesting. So if we blow that up a bit, you notice that and it's like, okay, the URLs are pretty the same. That's a good piece of notice, but there's a little kind of interesting detail about the ID numbers themselves. This is called how you can tell when a bad developer codes something. What's the issue with numbers? Okay, well, let's, let's see, let's see what the, what's going on that's a little bit wrong. It couldn't be that the numbers are consecutive. This is a good programming practice. Use random numbers with things and don't make things consecutive because that just made this whole problem a lot easier. I don't have to worry about trying to maybe go to another page to then scrape all their links to then figure out which pages to go to. I just know if I go from one to like 70,000, there should be enough pages there that have what I'm looking for that I can easily get the information without having to do extra work. And then so, okay, so I'm assuming they're consecutive. I, haven't, I need to prove it. I'm gonna just decrease the number by one. Oh, it is consecutive. This is great, except they're a little bit weird and not each number is, there's no meaning between the number and which game. So they literally have a, basically if you keep decreasing, you'll just see the results of different games, but it is consecutive in time. So later uh, IDs will have later dates. That still applies. But this does mean we might need to, when we are scraping the page, look for, is the, do we see the words Powerball and not like Cash for Life or any of the other games? But now let's, let's look, now look a little bit deeper into the page. This is where we're gonna bring out our best friend, the developer console. It's the greatest tool ever. Simply hit F12 and there it is. It's even cool because it has very nice tools to click and select right at the data and we can now take a little bit of a closer look at what, where the data is. And just as happens to be, as we see it, the data is surrounded by, it's a little hard to see on the screen, but there's a div tag that we're seeing. It has the ID of page contents and looks like it's containing everything we need. That's an awesome piece of detail. Uh, we also notice the data we want is contained between an H2 tag but there's a few of those, so we're going to need to do a little work to get to the one we need, but also good knowledge. Okay, so let's see, we know the data in this is uh, consistent. The IDs for the pages are consecutive. Each ID is for a different game, which is a little troubling, but we can, we can deal with that. And the data we need is contained in a div tag with the ID page content. We're going to keep this in mind for later. We're going to now switch over to the second problem of scheduling. So this is the web page specifically we're gonna try, we want to attack. Uh, it just has a basic, some basic search options, a search button. Um, so I'm gonna put, fill in some values and then hit search. One thing to notice, the page is loading. That's interesting. The URL also has not changed. And boom, our content has now been dynamically added. Those three points, the URL hasn't changed, loading, content of page just changed. It's probably calling web UI. I'm, I think that's a, maybe a little bit obvious, but it's just good telltale signs that we're dealing with that, which means let's open up the developer console and, and investigate. Because in the developer console, there is a very nifty network tab that tracks specifically network traffic of things being downloaded. So whenever we hit the search button, it's gonna track the requests, gonna give us a lot of information that's gonna be useful for us to then later exploit that. There's also a very handy button to clear it because once you reload the page, it's gonna show you every single download of every single image and every single request and you wanna just quickly wipe that away. So, okay, we're gonna hit the search button. Let's see what happens. There is a little page of calls that says get class search. Interesting. We look into it. Okay, there's a few interesting details here. One, we have the URL. Okay, that's already off to a good start. We know it's a post request. Also really good information uh, with post requests. You have to send some information over or not really, but it's typically that's what's going on in a post request. And so, okay, let's close a few of those 
sections and let's look. Form data. Interesting. There is some interesting details in here. First of all, it has things like the term, which uh, is pr meaningless to you, means something to me, um, but it basically means fall of the this year. Uh, but campus, PID, academic career, undergrad, subject, computer science, or CS, pretty, pretty easy to link up and understand that. So all the data that we need to really fill in is in these. Uh, there's also this additional detail called a CSRF token. It's a little bit out of the scope of what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to just hand wave like that doesn't exist. But it's a basically it's a whole security thing, and it's going to be necessary later. I'm going to just show you what the workaround is. Um, but this is basically this is a neat piece of information. It gets generated every single time you go to the page, and it's needed in order to actually finally get the information. It's like okay, we got that. Also in that same network tab, and looking under that. Um, looking at that page download, it also shows you the contents, which in this case happens to be HTML. And it's looking like what's going on is just literally takes the HTML and just plops it right on the page. No weird JSON stuff, so that's some good information also. And also all the data we need seems to be in a fairly organized format. There might be some complicated stuff going on, but it's doable. So again, uh, information is consistent, which is always a great thing. Uh, we know the endpoint of the API, which is get class search. We know it's a post request. We know what form data is needed to get the particular data. And then also, it's fun to play around with them. I mean, web AI APIs can be so much fun, especially to break them. <laughs> there are, I think, the best websites are any major sports league, so NFL, NHL, NBA, they all have websites, they all have live game trackers. They only basically work by calling the same, same web API every second. And usually you can mess around with things. So I decided, what would happen if I just happened to request for not a specific subject, but all subjects? And I could not believe that it had no catches for this, and it tried to give me every single section offered by my university, every single class. That's pretty bad design. That's the fun of looking into these things. But now, let's get into the meat of this stuff, scraping. Scraping, how I particularly do it, is in a very, it's a kind of like a data scraping exploration phase. Typically, the tools of the trade for me are the Python interpreter. It's just really easy to type things and just like mess around on the fly. Or Jupyter Notebook if you want to be more official and try to like actually make it good. Um, and also, in the whole process, things are likely going to be hacked together. I'm going to show you code that's actually broken, and I did not realize that until about an hour ago. But that's the fun of it. It's just, it's literally a lot of it just like hacking together, trying to figure out how to manipulate and get things to work in your way. If you're actually trying to build a proper scraper, there's better tools for that. But we're going to now go into the libraries, the true meat. And it starts with our friend requests. Quest is going to, is just a library for requesting anything over HTTP. In our case, it's going to be the web page. So this is for the first, ex uh, this first example of the lottery. So I just did a very basic thing where import it. I made this nice constant uh, variable of just the URL with a little placeholder at the end, because I like to do dot format on that. And then I just have a basic request, which to do it in requests, it's really simple. You say request. In this case, I need to do a get request. So I say dot get. And then I plop the URL in there. And what I'm doing is it takes that number and it just puts it right at the end of, in that placeholder I put at the end of the URL. And cool, we now got the web page. This will just do it. That's, it's that easy. That's why it's HTTP for humans. Now the true part. Into the world of beautiful soup, the weirdest named library ever. I kid you not, it has the weirdest objects, including a soup strainer. So to import it, it's pretty easy to install. It's a little weird. You just have to uh, do a nice pip install on BS4, and then you import uh, beautiful soup from that. To use it, it's kind of also pretty simple. I'm going to make a variable called soup. 
I'm going to constru do construct a beautiful soup object. I'm going to take our response, say response.txt, which will just give me the text. But also, fun fact, if it happens to be something that gives you JSON, you can say dot JSON, and I'm pretty sure it'll just give you back a the JSON or a dictionary. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, there's also a secondary argument that I put in there that says LXML. It's just a parser library, which you also have to install, but it's very not explicit, and it's very hard to know about that. But also, in the process, you have to do pip install LXML. It just happens to be that's what's going on. So let's go back to the sort of details we picked out. It's mostly this about this div tag and with ID page content. It's really actually, this is where the APIs and people thinking about things really just comes to life. Because just to get the exact part I need, I can just say, I'm going to just make a variable called game content. Say, okay, on my soup, I want to find the tag div with the property ID page content. And this works in many different ways. You can do uh, the classes and all those other things to really search for the details or parts of the page you're looking for. So if we take a look, it happens to be the information we're looking for. Awesome. Let's remember again that we're also looking for the H2 tags. So, okay, we need to figure out how to find those now. So do that, it's really simple. You just say on that game content variable I made, just say find all H2. Find all instead of find gives you a list of things, while find will only return you one thing. And so in this case, I have a few things I'm getting from it. I'm getting, okay, P lottery, Powerball, evening winnings. Um, I'm getting the data that I want and how to find more PA lottery results. And cool. At this point, I could just ask for the index one of it. And this would actually kind of be fine. It's kind of weird how that, why this might be kind of fine. Uh, since we know it's a template and it's probably unlikely somebody for the PA lottery is going to change their website anytime soon, this will probably likely work for the long run. Though if we want to, we can get a little complicated. We can make a variable. We can go through each of the tags in there, check if like maybe the text winning numbers is in there. And if it's in there, then we'll hold on to that variable. And then we can do some checks like, OK, if that variable none, yada, yada. Now nah, we're just going to keep it simple. I'm just going to ask for the first index. And I can now easily say on that game data dot text, I can just get exactly what we're looking for. OK, we have the data. Now we need to break it up because it's all in just one single line and we need to sort of this is where sort of like hacking and the engineering perspective really comes in it's like how can we just put this in a convenient format for me to easily just split it up and the answer that I just came up with off the top of my head was what if we change winning numbers to a pipe powerball colon to a pipe power play to a pipe and then split it by pipes and just so happens that works extraordinarily well. We now have the, in every single piece of data in its own index, in its own element. And I just have to do one extra step of cleaning up, just trimming off, and maybe switching out those spaces for commas to make it a little bit cleaner on my end. So if I took it in as an array, it's a little more clear if it was uh, comma separated, not space separated. And cool, there we go. We have the entire process that we need to extract this single piece of data. And I can just now wrap this in an entire function and it's pretty much good to go and ready to fly. And so now we can easily go back all the way to the top using this new function. I can say easily draw underscore data equals this function I called extract draw numbers on that response and boom, I now get the data. Awesome, okay, next part. It's a little bit more interesting. So we recall that the IDs for the pages are consecutive, and each of them goes to a different game. OK. So let's start with the whole consecutive part. Uh, this is pretty easy. Let's just shove this thing into a for loop that goes from 1 to 72,000. Pretty simple, pretty easy. I also added an extra variable just to hold on to the results every single time. And then. Well, let's, what's an easy way to probably check if the game was the Powerball or not? Let's just check if the text exists in there. 
Uh, this is actually incorrect that I realized because Powerball probably does exist on the page on the left sidebar. Uh, the actually better place to look at it is in the that game content that we got, that just specifically trimmed down portion. That actually contains the word Powerball also, and that's actually a very much better way of understanding, okay, we know we chose the right game. We don't have to think about it now. But we're just going to trust that this works as expected. So hooray. We have two parts ready to go. We have the part that can go through all of these 72,000 pages, and we have the thing to then scrape it. Perfect. We are off to the races. Kind of. If it's not an immediate issue coming into your head, this is incredibly slow. Like, when I did this with my friend, we were walking around Pittsburgh for about an hour and 30 minutes for this thing to finish on my tiny little laptop. So how could we make this faster? I'm going to show you an example. This is not operationally yet. It's coming in new versions of this package called HTTPX which tries to do things asynchronously. And this is a way where it's like, OK, you're just basically trying to fire off multiple requests at the same time. Uh, there's a better library that's very stable and works really well called the Request Futures. I just really couldn't show you that because it gets really complicated because you probably need to make things like queues and whatnot. And you don't want to do so many pages at the same time. And it gets the code gets a little bit harder to understand but if you really want to just download like 12 pages at the same time and rapidly go through this, you can easily decrease your time that it takes a lot. Because it's, it's instead of doing one at a time, just fire, 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 it's just rapid to the point your computer is just so much hot air is just coming out of your computer. Okay. Back to now question number two. We know the endpoint API. So now we're going to, so we just, basically figure out how to exploit just basic web pages. Now, web APIs, which is a lot more interesting, and I think you'll probably find that and try to get at these a lot more often. Let's see, we also know it's a post request. We know what form is needed to request the data. Awesome. I'm about to show you a bunch of data, a bunch of code at, this, at once. Let's break this down, what's going on. The first uh, th four lines, requests, I also have two URLs. The uh, second one's more important than the first. Uh, what's going on here is that CSRF token stuff. I'm doing some weird magic to basically get that token. And so now this works. We're going to trust that works. But let's focus on the main portion, which is this sort of payload variable I made. It's a very simple dictionary. I just basically took what were the keys and values from that form data and just push them over here. I can now actually, even from this, make a very easy variable where I can adjust the values really simply, and I can get the different payloads that I need. So in this case, I just put the term number that I had, the pits, the CS, the undergrad. I have the same exact stuff. And to request from this, super easy. Um, I, it says session. Typically, you'll just still use request, but I'm using session for this whole CSRF cookie token stuff. But instead, we're going to use the post, because we saw that it was a post request. We just plop the URL in there. And then we just say data dot equals this payload. And it's just going to add this on. And cool. It's going to give us that same HTML data. And then this is where I'm going to just do another little hand wavy thing. Insert scraping function here. This, the code that, I, that does all this is something part of a library of code that I work on with my club called Pit API that just literally just dedicated to Let's grab as much information from our university as possible. Um, and so the, how that works is a l very, very complicated. So that's why if you're really interested, at the end, there's going to be a repository that's going to actually have all that information and how to like inspect what's going on. But in the end, I give it in this very nice structured format that makes more sense to Pitt students than anyone. <laughs> uh, but it includes information about, OK, here's the course number. So there's a uh, triple O. 0004. It has the things about the class, which is all these different data we're talking about, start date, end date, days, numbers, room, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. We know how to scrape two different things. Are we off to the races? Still no. There is now an interesting problem or dilemma that we're not maybe realizing. And especially it comes in more the Lauder website than the Pit API thing that's going on. 
And this is basically a message to uh, stop spamming, spamming web servers. Because if we see, this is how a typical user, you know, goes out of web server. You know, you, you open up a web page, you go to a web page, you make a simple connection. This is what engineers are accounting for that's going on. And then this is what you're doing if you use something like requests. So you might actually sometimes have to limit your scraper. Maybe don't use request as, maybe don't go 12 months. Maybe you have to instead add temporary time sleeps in there or random time sleeps if that's a little too robotic and you need to make it kind of look more human. Um, the issues with this is sometimes websites do catch on and they might just say, hey, too many requests and great, you're now scraping nothing and your thing's going nowhere. You sometimes just have to deal with it's going to take you an hour, 30 minutes to do this. You just don't have a choice. It just doesn't work like that. There's also another interesting thing that probably you, you're probably not thinking about when scraping the data. Constantly, if I keep running this data over and over again, this script over and over again, I'm constantly downloading the same web pages over and over again. And we can really just prevent future requests to the web page, especially if it's static content like lottery numbers. Like, they're not going to retroactively change it and be like, oh, whoever won, yeah, we're going to need your money back. That's just not going to happen. And what you can easily do is, okay, in the script, instead, just save the web page in a folder. It's fairly easy. You can make use uh, the awesome path lib library, quickly make an output directory, and then just file every single output you get into there. Really nice, really simple. You now have all the files in your system, and you can scrape those constantly. And the other benefit of doing this is what happens if your scraper just doesn't work? And, in, and you didn't expect that for maybe older results, it's doing something incredibly weird that you just could not account for. That's why having the data just there, you can adjust on the fly for whenever you just notice something just went off, but I don't have to now keep spamming their web servers to figure out how to make it correct. So that's all I have for the scraping. And this is just, again, use publicly available information. This is your last resort. Now, a very interesting topic. Maybe not. I don't know. It's constructing a data set. It's probably pretty easy. You know, you take that data we got. You maybe just import a CSV, a very convenient library to do this. Uh, you just write the top row and then just keep writing all the rows. Look at that. We got a nice uh, CSV with all the data. Woo! We can do the same thing for the other data set with all of its many, many columns and rows. Cool. We got data. Except these are absolutely horrid and bad for analysis. And this is where I'm going to bring in this interesting idea called tidy data. Tidy data is something that's more known in the R programming community because there's an entire universe of packages just dedicated to manipulating data and making it tidy. So let's look into what the principles of tidy data are. There's only three of them. It's really simple. Each variable forms a column. Each observation forms a row. Each type of observational unit forms a table. OK, let's, let's break this down with some examples I'm going to just take directly from this 20 page paper that the guy wrote to explain all this. So let's look at this table. OK, we got some, got some test subjects, we got some treatments, and we got some values. OK, uh, one thing I think we all can agree on is this is the probably correct way. You know, observations are the rows. We don't just put people as the columns. That just looks weird to us. So uh, that's, that's probably one very obvious thing that we can catch on to. This is fine. But one thing that you might be missing, because this looks pretty good for humans. There's a lot of tables that looks and is very intuitive to humans. But this is not intuitive for a computer. If I had to ask like, different questions about the different treatments, it's going to be kind of hard to filter because the, the treatments happens to be more of a variable than a column. And as the principle states, every column should be a variable. And there's three variables, if you don't believe me. There's people. There's values, and then there's treatments. So what really should be happening is treatments should become a column. And look, even better, we know that those values are values. That's so much nicer. And it, you can probably, if you imagine, just starting to filter through this data set, it's much easier to say, this column, I want to filter for this value, or this one I want to filter. It's a lot easier because you put it in this really nice way. 
So that's just basically like the first two in a nutshell. But there is a third one, which is a little bit weirder and com slightly complex. It's uh, each type of observational unit forms a table. This is like a weird idea that's closely something called database normalization, but the, the basic concept of it's trying to prevent two separate things. Data redundancy, which is basically the very indicator that something needs to be changed, and data integrity, because with redundancy, if someone makes one error in one of those things, well, great, it's, it's really destroying the integrity and quality of our data. So let's look at just a nice uh, set from also this study paper. Uh, this is just a data of top songs over a few weeks in their rankings. Um, and what we should sort of notice from this is this day is ki it's kind of redundant. You can pr see like there's like seven times it's Tupac's Baby Don't Cry. That's a lot. That sh it shouldn't need to be there so many times. That's just wasting so much unnecessary space. And this is what it's talking about when it means observational unit. There are two here. There is the song. And then there's the song's ranking. An easy way to fix this is put them into two tables and just have the other table have an ID that matches with the track that it goes with. And now, less redundancy, I can easily filter one or the other and then at some point merge them back together. That's the third principle and that's what it's talking about. It's sort of like trying to remove this redundancy and if you notice like with redundancy, one error messes up a lot of things. Let's now apply these principles. Okay, so let's, let's look at the code a little bit more this time. Okay, import CSV. We're going to create a CSV called draws. We're going to make a writer. We're going to write the first row. Cool. This one, things are about correct. There's not really much issue. The only issue actually just comes from a practice standpoint of there is an array of numbers in a column. And in this case... It doesn't need to be, even to solve the problem, it's actually better if they're not in, in an array like that. Uh, so I'm just gonna make one little sn weird snippet where I'm gonna take those numbers, I'm gonna split them by the commas, and then just gonna make an individual row for each number. So by the end, it looks like this. There's a lot of redundancy. I'm not gonna say that we need another observational unit for this one, because it doesn't need one. But now, it's much easier to me to look for all the numbers, sum them together, or do whatever other analytics I need on them. Now let's prepare your eyes. This one. This one's a little bit trickier, probably because it's also tinier on the screen. But there are three columns that happen to be pretty redundant. There's one that says the term number, which is the same across every single column and every single, sorry, every single row. Same as the subject is the same across every single row. And for only course number, sometimes the same every single row. And this is the case of when it comes down to university classes, there's a difference between the course and the classes that are offered. Because the course has information, but class has the other information about when it's happening. So a few adjustments. So this is the original script. Uh, how it works is basically uh, for each key in this weird dictionary is a course. Inside the course has all of the classes, and then I just write each row, yada, yada, yada. This is the better solution. This is a, a lot of code. Let's break this down, what I just did. One, I'm taking advantage of dictionaries because dictionaries are awesome. They're fast. They're great data structures in Python. So I'm going to make one called course keys, which I have the sole purpose of. I want to take that course number, and I want to put it with some ID. In this case, I'm going to use a, this other counter variable to have it a continuously incrementing ID. And then for each of those writes to a CSV, in the first one, that is gonna, I'm going to want to write the table for the courses. And so the first thing I'm going to do is actually add the key, make the key equal whatever the counter is at that moment, write the row, and then add one to the counter so that it now is the next ID. So that whenever the next course comes in, it's going to be that next ID. And then for the bottom one, all I'm going to do is just retrieve the ID based upon whichever course and then just put it right into the table. So that's just in general what's going on in all of this. So what's going to happen is there's going to be now two tables 
The first one is about courses. We have the IDs that link to each one. It has all the information. As you can see, the only thing that got less redundant is the course number, which is fine for this uh, situation. And then the bottom one, now it's just every single, basically, class that's offered, which is really, really nice. And now finally, the sort of exciting part, using the data set. I'm, we're only going to do this really briefly. Let's have some statistical fun. So, okay, so there you have to do some kind of interesting uh, significance test on the lottery data. And the number we have to beat is approximately 300. If the, whatever test statistic comes out, if it beats uh, 300, cool. Let's see what we got. Yeah, those ball machines are really, really random. And that's sort of just, and now that's sort of the end of our journey because after that, now that's when the analytics begins. That's when f understanding the features and everything, the data sets comes in. But we, what we went through is just we sort of thought about the problems. And honestly, the problem can change over time. And we sort of, with those changes, can understand like what data do we truly need from our sources. We had a, a little bit of a high level view of what are we trying to scrape and get out of this data. Um, but there are a lot of tutorials and stuff, and it goes super deep. There are ways you can like try to log into websites and then scrape data from there. And then we also learned about that tidying up data is kind of important. If you need something a little more powerful than what I presented, which was requests in Beautiful Soup, there is a library that's literally just made for this called Scrapey. That's much better. If you need to do larger scale things, this is the way to do it. This is the link to find all the code snippets I had in their better, proper form, slides, everything. That's my GitHub. That's how you can contact me. Thank you very much.